your didactic for you. And anytime you're ready, just let me know when you'd like to go to the next screen. All right, so like I said, my name's Froz. I'm one of the uh, occupational medicine residents at WVU, and I'll be presenting about hard metal lung disease. Uh, so next slide. So what is a hard metal? So essentially it's a composite material consisting of a metal matrix and a secondary hard phase, which I'll ex explain a little bit more on the next slide. Uh, but there are three types. Uh, there's tungsten carbide cobalt, uh, also known as cemented carbide. There's hard steel, and then there's cermets, uh, ceramics are essentially uh, a mixture of cer uh, ceramics and metals. Uh, next slide, please. So the one that I'll be discussing uh, today is the cemented carbide. So it's uh, made uh, with initially combining tungsten and carbon into tungsten carbide, and then taking tungsten carbide and combining it uh, with cobalt to make the cemented carbide. Uh, as you can see, the cobalt sort of acts like a binder between the tungsten carbide particles, uh, allowing it to solidify. Uh, next slide, please. So who are the suppliers in West Virginia specifically? Well, the two that I was able to find, one was called Sandshell Products, Inc., and one was Excal. Um, Excal had uh, a better presence, I would think. They had a website you could go through. Sandshell didn't seem to have that, but it seemed to be active. They were both located in Oak Hill, and they uh, had tungsten carbide uh, powders that they uh, produced. Um, I know a lot of people have probably heard of Union Carbide as well. Uh, they don't actually produce cemented carbide. They uh, are the largest producers of antifreeze, uh, which includes like ethylene glycol, ethylene oxide, um, and sort of other solvents. Historically, at one time, they did produce chromium, manganese, silicone, uh, alloys and calcium carbide. Next slide, please. So which industries are exposed um, to this cemented carbide? Well, once it becomes cemented carbide, it attains, attains a high level of hardness. So it's used in a variety of metal cutting tools, um, drills, lays, and uh, a lot of the industries um, that can get exposed are construction, manufacturing, uh, mining, tunneling, uh, machining itself and diamond polishing because uh, you know cemented carbides very hard. Uh, it helps to be able to polish diamonds, which are also equally as hard. Next slide, please. So, how often does hard metal lung disease occur? Well, it's it was it was hard to find numbers. The the only one that I found said the prevalence ranges from 0.13% to 3.8% of tungsten carbide workers, uh, but it's pretty rare even in the occupations uh, that are at risk that I mentioned uh, in the uh, earlier slide. Uh, and the, on the right, you can see some uh, pictures of uh, some cemented carbide uh, drill tips. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the risk factors? Well, the main route of exposure to the cemented carbide dust is through inhalation but there is an unknown dose exposure relationship. There is suspected genetic susceptibility uh, to this, um, where the residue glutamate 69 on the HLA-DP beta chain is uh, suspected. Uh, this residue is also associated with chronic beryllium disease, uh, which I'll get into a little bit later as well. Next slide, please. So what are the symptoms of hard metal lung disease? Well, there are some subacute symptoms uh, that can last for months to years, dyspnea, cough, um, sore throat, nasal congestion, sneezing. Uh, in addition, there can also be fever, chills, and weight loss. Uh, by the time it progresses to chronic uh, disease, usually uh, you retain most of the symptoms except for the fever, chills, and weight loss. So they can still have the cough, uh, obviously the dyspnea, um, and some of the other symptoms. Next slide. So when somebody comes in, it's uh, very important to ask about an occupational history. So you want to know if the patient cuts metal at work, do they work near workers using hard metal tools? Um, and very importantly, do their symptoms improve when away from work? Uh, the exam can be pretty nonspecific. Uh, you, can, you can hear inspiratory crackles, you might see some clubbing and cyanosis, but it, there's not a guarantee that any of these uh, exam findings will pop up. Next slide. 
So what is the pathophysiology? Uh, well, currently it's unknown. So uh, it ranges from hypersensitivity-like pathophysiology to more of a pneumoconiosis-like, um, similar to like silica or asbestos. But there are two leading theories on uh, what causes hard metal lung disease. Next slide. So the first theory is it's an immunologic mechanism where the host activates an adaptive immune response that leads to inflammation and then uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, some of some of the uh, things supporting this mechanism is that one, there's a variable latency period on um, hard metal lung disease. Some patients are affected a few years after exposure. Some patients, it, it takes decades for them to start showing symptoms. And then uh, secondly, there's a genetic risk factor, which is similar to chronic beryllium disease, um, which in a small person, only a small person percentage of exposed workers um, end up getting the disease. Not every worker exposed to the cemented carbide will get hard metal lung disease. Um, and it also lacks a linear dose relationship. The component in cemented carbide thought to be causing this uh, immunologic reaction is cobalt. And cobalt is a known sensitizer that already causes antibody production and positive skin patch testing. Next slide, please. So the second theory is that it's an oxidant mechanism um, where cobalt's um, causing increased production of activated oxygen species causing uh, interstitial lung disease with the potential hydroxyl radical. So there was a study done in 1991 that uh, did an intratracheal installation of uh, cobalt chloride into hamster lungs that showed changes that were consistent with oxidative stress. And uh, other studies have been done that show that this uh, oxidative stress reaction is enhanced whenever tungsten carbide is in the mixture, which, as you know, the cemented carbide uh, com mixture com consists of tungsten carbide and cobalt. So next slide, please. So what are some laboratory tests that can be done if you have somebody that comes in? Well, uh, you could potentially do a cobalt lymphocyte proliferation test. However, it hasn't really demonstrated results um, with hard metal lung disease. There's skin patch testing for cobalt, but it's really only good for contact dermatitis. And again, not really as good for hard metal lung disease. Uh, you could check the serum or urine cobalt levels, um, but uh, it's pretty nonspecific. There can be interference from multivitamins, and uh, if anybody has prosthesis containing cobalt, it could also interfere um, with the laboratory tests as well. Next slide, please. So imaging wise, start off with an x-ray. Um, it could be normal. Uh, it could show non-specific patterns, like nodular, reticul reticulonodular, and reticular patterns, so pretty non-specific. Next slide. And there's uh, high resolution CT scan, but again, similar to uh, you know a lot of interstitial lung diseases, you could see a lot of these findings, but it, there's no specific finding saying that if you see this on CT, it's indicative specifically of hard metal lung disease, which is why it's also essential to you know have an exposure history uh, of hard metal. Next slide, please. PFTs, again, um, pretty nonspecific. They can show mixed or restrictive pattern um, because of the fibrosis, and they could show reduc reduction in diffusing capacity, but again, nothing, no sort of uh, flow pattern loop that's indicative specifically of uh, hard metal lung disease. Next slide. Another option is to do a bronchiolar lavage, which has shown variable uh, results. Some of these uh, patients have shown increased cellularity, but uh, had normal differential. Some of them show increased lymphocytes, neutrophils, and eosinophils. Um, one thing that is thought to be more diagnostic are these multinucleated giant cells uh, with imperipolysis, uh, which essentially means they um, uh, sort of intake these lymphocytes or these neutrophils or eosinophils whole without um, sort of breaking them up. And they're also known as cannibalistic giant cells. So next slide. Um, with that, you it, if you take a lung biopsy um, and you also see pneumonia, uh, chronic inter interstitial pneumonia with fibrosis in the bronchiolocentric pattern, along with those previously mentioned um, giant cells, that's thought 
that was for a long time thought to be pathognomonic for giant interstitial pneumonia. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, more studies have come out that show that um, it isn't always the case if you find giant inter interstitial pneumonia that they will have hard metal uh, lung disease. Uh, but it's uh, it's strongly suggestive that they could have it if there is a if there is an exposure history. Um, on pathology, you might also see uh, you know alve alveolar pneumocyte hyperplasia, and you could potentially see granulomas, but uh, that's not always seen. Next slide, please. So they, these are some of the uh, giant cells. Um, as you can see, they're multinucleated. They're pretty big. <laughs> um, so yeah. Next slide. So treatment-wise, uh, there are a couple things that can be done. Um, obviously, exposure cessation is very important. Um, there can, uh, you can try steroids, non-steroid immunosuppressive therapies, and lung transplantation. However, the results of these can vary uh, between patients, and not all of them you know, will respond to one of these therapies or all of these therapies, potentially, and they could still progress. So next slide, please. So exposure cessation is very important to do. It could potentially uh, improve or cause remission of the subacute disease. There is um, a case report of a 27-year-old hard metal grinder had been working uh, as a hard metal grinder for 10 years, started having symptoms. Um, they removed him from his workplace and he's noticed improvement in symptoms and on radiology as well. So it's uh, definitely a possibility. Next slide. Uh, corticosteroids, there was a case report, uh, there was a review done of 18 case reports um, that showed improvement in 77.8% of patients using uh, inhaled corticosteroids. Interestingly enough, they noted that if there were reticular opacities seen on the CT scan, that there was increased resistance to corticosteroids. And some other articles report potential improvement with systemic steroids, but uh, because you know, it's such a rare disease. Uh, case numbers are so low. There really are no articles with any sort of placebo comparison or comparison between uh, inhaled corticosteroids and systemic corticosteroids that I could find. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some people believe that, you know, non-steroid immunosuppression could potentially be better. There was a retrospective study done uh, of the University of Pittsburgh patients from 1985 to 2016. Uh, 23, 23 of the patients uh, had hard metal lung disease. 10 of them received either azathioprine or cyclophosphamide. Um, some of them also had PFTs done at that time. So if you look to the right, um, you can see that there's the FVC percentage uh, on the top graph and the FEV1 percentage on the bottom graph. And uh, with the uh, steroids sparing immunosuppression, uh, you can see that there were uh, varied responses. Some of them improved, some of them stayed stable, um, and some of them continued to um, trend downward. So uh, a pretty variable response. Next slide, please. Uh, lung transplant is also an option. Uh, there's a case report of a 45-year-old male who had hard metal lung disease. He underwent left single uh, lung transplantation. He was put on um, immunosuppression, uh, he did pretty well up until post-op day 300, started having symptoms again. You know, they sort of changed around uh, the dosages of his immunosuppression. He, you know, sort of went back and forth. Um, and then around post-op day 900, um, he ultimately ended up dying. They did an autopsy and they saw that the transplanted lung had also um, had recurrence of hard metal lung disease. And I should note that he was taken uh, out of work, so... Um, it's, it's a lung transplantation, you know, it's not an automatic uh, sort of cure and might not necessarily fix that the person with the disease. Uh, next slide, please. So there was, uh, in 2019, there was an interesting case report of an e-cigarette causing hard metal lung disease. So there's a 49-year-old woman. She presented with, in, with shortness of breath. She said she had started using a marijuana vaping pen uh, in the past six months. Her lungs actually had inspiratory crackles on exam. PFTs showed restrictive pattern. CT showed ground glass opacities. They did a biopsy, which showed giant cells and uh, bronchiolocentric fibrosis, which all was um, pointing them in the direction of hard metal lung disease. Uh, so they did an analysis of the vape pen e-liquid, which revealed uh, significant levels of cobalt. 
so they, she obviously stopped vaping. They started her on mycophenolate. Uh, she started having improvements of her symptoms, but then she stopped taking the mycophenolate after three months because uh, she was having side effects. So they did some PFTs and uh, showed that her PFTs compared to her uh, or the previous ones had uh, showed a decline. So they put her on prednisone uh, for a year. Uh, about 30 months afterwards, they did more you know, PFTs, CT scans, which were pretty stable, but there were, actual some, there were actually some subtle CT changes uh, suggesting mild fibrosis, um, so continued uh, slow progression uh, of the disease still. This was the only one, uh, it's the only case report I found of the e-cigarettes, so I, I don't know how common it is, um, but this was uh, definitely an interesting case because you would expect, um, you wouldn't really expect it, expect to see hard metal lung disease from this case. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that um, we do in occupational medicine is to use a hierarchy of controls to prevent um, these uh, illnesses and diseases from occurring. Um, so this is from NIOSH. Obviously the uh, most effective thing is elimination and then substitutions, less effective engineering controls, administrative controls, and then PPE. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things, um, is there's a, uh, another alloy called stellite, which is a cobalt chromium alloy uh, with some carbon. There was a cross-sectional study done of 118 saw filers in lumber mills uh, who maintained the saws, cleaned the saws, um, made sure they were working correctly. And they noted that there was uh, more cobalt exposure uh, with the workers that were working near the tungsten carbide blades compared to the stellite blades. Uh, so it could potentially be better to use stellite blades to have less of cobalt exposure. Um, but the, the issue becomes if they become, um, you know, potentially sensitized, if it's an immunologic reaction, there's really no sort of um, safe uh, exposure limit at that point. But this would be more for trying to prevent uh, excess cobalt dust from being in the workplace initially. The, the downside to stellite blades is that there were more, there's more chromium exposure noted to workers near those blades. And obviously chromium has its own um, set of problems. So uh, I think it's sort of a mixed bag there. Next slide. So in summary, the key points of hard metal lung disease. So it's thought to, it occurs with inhalation exposure to hard metal such as cemented carbide and thought to be due to the cobalt component of cemented carbide. And the pathophysiology is strongly suggestive of an immunologic mechanism, similar to beryllium. It's very important to get a good occupational history. Um, some of the uh, tests can be nonspecific, but if you see giant interstitial pneumonia, um, along with the, uh, uh, or if you see the giant cells along with the um, fibrosis, uh, bronchiolocentric fibrosis, then that can be strongly indicative of hard metal lung disease and treatment has varying levels of response. So it's not a guarantee that, you know, taking somebody off work will completely prevent them from progressing to having worsening hard metal lung disease, or if you give them a, a new lung that it will um, uh, cure their hard metal lung disease. So that's about it. All right, any questions? Thank you so much, Fraz. That was such an interesting topic. I'm so appreciative of you taking the time to do that. Um, and I, I really like the case study that you found and included in there as well. So thank, thank you. you again. Um, so we'll open it up for any questions, comments, thoughts from the group. Dr. Martin, I know you're already ready with some questions. <laughs> but yeah, if anyone has questions, please uh, unmute, chat in, whichever way you prefer. Raz, I actually had a question uh, for you. So I know like after listening to your PowerPoint, um, I know how important it is to do an occupational history um, to determine, I guess, like a diagnosis, but do you find that it's sort of overlooked at times? Um, maybe some providers think it's something else or they forget to look back on the occupational side of things and maybe what, they're, um, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis or, what are your thoughts on that? I think uh, the occupational history 
that's tends to be overlooked at times um, because you know providers are very busy. Um, there's a uh, you patients come in, you have um, sort of you know what you normally see, what you think it is, and uh, I I find that the occupational history tends to be overlooked. It can be it can be pretty challenging to get a full thorough occupational history as well um, because you know say they in this case you know if they weren't working as a hard metal grinder for like the past five years, but maybe 10 years ago, they worked at, at it for maybe two years and then quit. It's, it can be uh, challenging to get a full thorough occupational history. And, you know, a lot of people uh, don't have the time, but it, it's pretty important, especially in cases where, you know, the patient's not improving and you don't really know what's causing it. So it could potentially be exposure at work that could be causing uh, those symptoms. Absolutely. Thank you. Fraz, this is uh, Dean Gunner, Pocahontas Memorial Hospital. I, I was wondering, uh, the the cobalt in the vape pen was it was it in the pen itself, or was it in the solution? So, so they said it was in the solution, uh, but they didn't sort of specify if it had leached from the pen itself into the solution. They just said they analyzed the solution and found levels of cobalt. I'm I'm assuming um, it would likely be leaching from the pen, but it was not specified. Are there plans to study study that more? Uh, they didn't mention that uh, in the paper. I, I'm assuming they'll probably be looking into it, but it wasn't explicitly stated. Great question, Dean. Thank you. And it was only one case report that I found. There were really no other ones. So I, I don't know if it was, you know, something that was faulty in this vaping pen or a solution um, because it's, it's not like the, um, you know, the E-Valley cases that are popping up where there are multiple ones. This was the only one, at least that was reported. Um, but I don't know, maybe if it, maybe it's, if it's gone unrecognized, it, it could potentially be um, flying under the radar. This is uh, Chris Martin, and uh, as Mitra said, you can't escape your program director. <laughs> so um, thank you very much. Uh, that was a great, great, thorough presentation. You've made us very proud, Froz, uh, once again. So thank you very much. Um, one, well, Actually, really more comments than questions. In, in terms of comments, just looking at recognizing one of the names in that uh, vaping case report, uh, is out of Johns Hopkins. So uh, was that case, do you know, in the United States? It was published in a European journal, but I'm, I'm worried that it, it's not far from us. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think it was in France that they said. Okay. Yeah, yeah cause, cause Anna Maria Rule is at, is at Hopkins. So I uh, didn't, didn't know if that was a uh, US case, but certainly share the other uh, questioners concern that that could potentially greatly enhance the number of people uh, suffering from this disease. This, the second comment I have is really a, a chance to get on my soapbox when you mentioned cobalt um, and that direct measurements of cobalt are, are rarely helpful. And since we have community providers here, I, I just wanna echo that message. We see a lot of problems created when uh, people uh, understandably see the availability of a large number of elements that they can order um, and provide measurements. Uh, they, they really are fraught with so many problems. And I guess what I'm referring to is every element that you might be exposed to other than lead and cadmium. If you're measuring lead and cadmium, we have pretty good reference ranges and we know that they have very long half-lives in the body. But many other elements, uh, zinc, copper, cobalt, uh, I see a lot of uh, issues with manganese. Uh, there's a whole host of problems such that we, we usually recommend they not be performed at all uh, for that reason. In, in some cases, the half-life is so short that you can get a false negative result. And as you mentioned, for cobalt, you can get false positive results uh, through the use of, of supplements, et cetera. And more fundamentally, we just simply don't know what a normal level is. Um, and then finally, with some, such as copper and manganese, these are essential elements. And so the body uh, has homeostatic mechanisms to regulate them, meaning that um, inferences about occupational exposure are really problematic. The way that I illustrate that is uh, 
And it would be like saying in a non-diabetic, I want to know if you had five donuts for breakfast by checking um, a glucose level. Of course, that's that the glucose is going to be tightly regulated. It's not going to tell you whether you had five donuts for breakfast or not. And so the, just getting the message out that uh, to our community providers that really a good occupational uh, history is, is what will serve you the best uh, rather than trying to directly measure these in, in blood. Most of them are available because of nutritional deficiencies and not because of occupational exposures, but it creates all sorts of uh, confusion uh, with the cases. So uh, you, you escaped me, Fraz, with no question, <laughs> but we've got people on the call like uh, Dr. Petsonk who are real, they're, they're the masters, so you're not out of the woods yet. I, I did want to clarify, um, I, the case report, uh, it, it didn't say where that person was from, so... Okay. Uh, it didn't specify the United States. I, I thought I had read somewhere France, but uh, I, I'm not sure. Thank you for those comments, Dr. Martin. Any other comments or thoughts from the group? We got a hand clap emoji from Dr. <laughs> Dr. Petsong. Thank you. Thank you. So, all right. Well, I can give you all about 30 minutes back to your morning. Um, I just have a couple housekeeping things. Um, but before I get into those, big, big thank you again for us for such a wonderful uh, session and didn't. We learned so much from you today. So I'll be sending out a recap email with your PowerPoint.